Hi, everyone. Um, I want to welcome you to today's uh, session. It's going to be really interesting. Um, I just want to go over a few things. If you have questions, you can always post them in the CG2C Care Online Forum. You need to register for that, but it doesn't cost you anything. And um, there are people there that will answer questions almost immediately. Um, and you can see all the past webinars since 2010 in the archives. And if you want to find out webinars that have tiny bits about a particular subject, you can use the Google search function. And that will uh, find them for you. And you can always contact me. This is my email address. And we also have the website. We have a Facebook page, and we have Twitter. And coming up next month, we're going to do something on crowdsourcing, which should be really interesting. I don't know much about it myself, so I'm, I'm, I'm interested to learn. And then we're going to have something about um, collections care training for small museums, how you should set it up for yourselves. And I want to remind you, if you have questions, Put them in the questions comment box, and I will catch them. And we'll make sure that they get answered. If they're not answered in today's session before we have to end, um, they can be answered uh, in writing. And I'll post them uh, along with the recording. The recordings usually get posted about a couple days afterwards. And I, I post any handouts. I post the, the PowerPoint slides. And so all of that's available to you. So we'll start. Um, we have Tony Kaiser and Paul Storch. I'll let them uh, introduce themselves. And here we go. Excellent. Thank everyone so much for coming today. I'm trying to, this is Tony Kaiser. And We're going to let my the <laughs> National World War II Museum in New Orleans, Louisiana. And I have, we have probably in our collection over 500 firearms um, that we keep track of and uh, display, as well as used for different behind the scenes tours as well. And I can't advance the slides yet. Is there something um, I want to do, Susan? I, I will. Oh, there there we go. Okay. All right. Well, okay. Thank you all again uh, for visiting us today. Um, so I'm going to start with my presentation with some common questions that are related to firearms collecting. And I base this a lot off of uh, the questions that I get from donors, um, but also from other museum professionals about how my institution goes about collecting firearms. So one of the first questions that you have to ask yourself is, is it legal? And um, with that, I'd like to uh, put up the first poll and get a little feedback on if any of you have any um, questions about whether or not you have firearms um, whose legal status you are unsure of. So there's two competing laws that you'll often have to keep in mind with uh, when it comes to whether or not firearms is, are legal. Um, first is national law, um, NSA, or the National Firearms Act. And this governs all of us here in the United States. But then, depending on what state you are in, you may have further state laws that regulate or stipulate what you can and cannot collect. So let's see, how did we do there? OK, good to know. Um, so I would always recommend, if you do have questions about firearms in your collection that you're unsure of their status, that you do contact a local ATF agent. I find that when it comes to museums and other institutions, the ATF is very, very helpful and very friendly when it comes to helping resolve issues with firearms. Um, they often are very historically minded as well in the sense that they often want to preserve firearms versus um, cut them up, which is uh, one of the legal requirements for firearms that are illegal. And I'll talk about that in just a second. So I'm going to concentrate on talking about the National Firearms Act, because that is something that, for those of us in the United States, we all have to adhere to. So here are some sort of go-tos for what the National Firearm Act regulates. Machine guns, yes. Rifles and pistols and shotguns, no, unless they're short barrels. And that's a concealment issue. 
Um, I think most of us are probably going to be dealing in sporting weapons. So uh, for most part, your shotguns are going to be um, not regulated by the Firearms Act. Mortars and other destructive devices, this is things like flamethrowers, grenades, or even large cannons if you have if you think about VFWs that often have um, artillery pieces out front. These are regulated, and then silencers are regulated as well. So one thing to keep in mind, um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about machine guns since those are often the firearms that people will have a question about. Since rifles and pistols and shotguns aren't regulated as much, I am going to talk a little bit more about machine guns because these, uh, this is what sort of crops up for us often. And I will say that just because it is regulated, it doesn't mean that it's illegal. And machine guns are legal to possess in the United States. The law just requires that they be registered. There were amnesty periods throughout the, throughout the United States where firearms could, machine guns could be registered. And um, as long as they have the proper forms, it is still legal to possess to transfer, to buy, to sell uh, machine guns. And buy a machine gun, uh, the definition for that of the ATF is that you can, can fire bullets continuously with one trigger pull. If you think about a lot of um, rifles, their bolt action or single shot, uh, revolvers, again, each trigger pull represents one bullet fired. And the big thing that ATF regulates are those weapons, machine guns and submachine guns, which can fire continuously. If, however, you encounter a machine gun that is not registered, they also can still be transferred legally um, to government entities. So if you are a museum that is part of a county, state, uh, or federal entity, you can also acquire those unregistered machine guns. Um, for registered machine guns, you'll want to fill out a form called a Form 4. And then for those non-registered machine guns, if you are a government entity, you'll want to fill out something called a Form 10. This is, again, where knowing a local ATF agent can be very, very helpful. Um, they will make sure that you have the proper forms and also help you decipher uh, the kind of form that you need and make sure that you are adhering to all of the uh, laws that you need to, both um, for the Federal Firearms Act and for any state regulations that you may have. Luckily, for a lot of us, since we collect older things, there is a designation for antique firearms. And these are items made, or guns made before 1898. And they are not regulated at all. So this, for instance, would be muskets, flintlocks, those types of older rifles um, where you think about powder horns and um, all that kind of stuff to be able to even fire. So uh, a lot of us collecting older materials will have a lot of things in this category. And a second category that's very helpful for a lot of museums is a category of weapons called curio and relics. And these are considered firearms that are more than 50 years old or have um, a, a special interest. And so the ATF defines this as items that are novel, rare, bizarre, or because of their association with some, some historical figure, period, or event, they can be uh, collected a little bit more loosely than um, those firearms that fall into modern handguns or outside the antique realm as well. Um, and so my second question is if anyone, if you want to put up the second poll, is if anyone has a C&R license or a curio and relic license. Uh, Tony, while people are um, filling out this uh, this survey, I'd like to know if it would be possible for you, please, to uh, increase your um, input volume on your microphone. If you look up at the microphone icon at the top of your screen, click the little down arrow, you can scroll to adjust microphone volume. And if you could move that over uh, a little bit over towards the right, about 3 quarters, maybe a little bit more over, that should uh, help. OK, is that better? Oh, much better. Thank you so much. All right, yeah, OK, thank you. All right, well, interesting. Um, I, uh, my institution does have a CNR license, but we obviously, with the nature of the items that we collect, do collect a significant amount of firearms. And it, um, I would suggest for those of you who have collections with lots of firearms, um, especially if you end up with things past 1898, that you do uh, think about uh, receiving a curio in relics license. It is a form of the federal firearms license, which really just makes it easier 
to collect things for your institution. Um, and I'm sorry, I have a slide off, but yes, it does allow for easier transfer and shipping. And this, again, will come into what I'm actually going to talk about next, which is how you take possession. Once you've decided that a firearm that you're being offered is legal to possess and that you are legal to possess it as someone who has a Curio and Relics license. Now, what this also will do is if you happen to live in a state that has very restrictive gun laws or firearm laws, the Curio and Relics um, opens up uh, the ability to possess these things as an institution that, as a private individual, you would not necessarily be able to do. So physical acceptance. I'm going to talk about this in two ways. First is in person, and the second is by mail. So um, one of the things that we always try to do is require an appointment. And I say try because I happen to work in an institution where people show up often um, with all manner of things, including firearms, uh, um, just for random donation. So I do try very hard, though, to make sure that people who are interested in donating firearms to us uh, have gone through some paperwork ups beforehand so that we've established that it's legal and all that kind of thing and require them to come by appointment. Also remind them of no live ammunition. Uh, my institution, as both through our uh, fire marshal and through our insurance company, does not let, let us collect any live ammunition. And this also includes flares that would be, if you were think about safety, flare guns, no flares either. Um, in an instance where live ammunition does come into the collection, we uh, utilize our local police department to dispose of it for us. Um, especially with older ammunition, um, it is not usually and would not recommend firing it uh, for private use or anything like that. Um, call, a fire, call a fire department, call your local police department, best thing to do. Also, always remind people to make sure that the weapons that they're bringing in are not loaded. This is a safety issue, of course. Um, and then also be aware of your surroundings, uh, be conscientious of those around you. Some people, especially in this day and age where active shooter is something that we talk about really regularly, um, you want to make sure that uh, your other security, your security personnel, other staff in the institution, or even visitors who may see a firearm coming in the door or um, at a desk uh, are aware of what's happening and um, feel safe um, even in the presence of a firearm as well. And then for um, the other thing that I'll mention for physical acceptance is to ensure that you have the proper staff on hand to make sure that the weapon is cleared. So uh, as a curator, if you're the person or collections person, if you're accepting it, hopefully um, you feel as though you have the skill set to ensure that the firearm is not loaded. But if not, uh, that's the great thing about requiring an appointment is that you could make sure that the right security staff or curatorial staff is on hand to ensure that you're not bringing in um, a loaded weapon. So uh, when you're thinking about accepting things by mail, there are four factors to consider. First is who is sending the gun. And there are lots of different scenarios of this, and you can read some of this, uh, more of this online. Uh, but I'm going to concentrate on a couple of things that I think are going to be most particular to those of us in museums. So first, who is sending the gun? This is usually going to be a private individual to a licensed collector. And this is where having the CNR is very helpful. And uh, having that CNR means that you've already been sort of pre-approved to possess it. You don't have to um, go through extra steps with the ATF to have it in your uh, collection or in your care. And then who is receiving the gun? Um, if you. Uh, are accepting a machine gun, depending on your local law, you may have to go through a licensed FFL dealer, a federal firearms uh, licensed dealer. And this is just another insurance check through the ATF that the uh, weapon is legal to possess um, and that the person it is going to or entity that it's going to is able to have it in its possession. You'll most often run into needing to work with an FFL dealer when you're um, dealing with guns that are being transferred across state lines. The second set of factors is what kind of gun is it? Um, antique gun, 
you're, you're in the clear. Uh, you don't have to worry about uh, firearms licenses, whether or not you have a CNR. Um, shipping of these is, very, is really quite easy since they're not regulated at all. If you have a handgun, this is going to usually fall on something that has um, excuse me, with uh, your CNR license. Um, In-state versus out-of-state will often make a difference. If, if a firearm is crossing state lines, you will likely need to ensure that the person has, uh, bringing it to you or mailing it to you has the proper paperwork. We often provide a copy of our CNR license to, and to people who are mailing us weapons. Um, uh, but we do that for both in-state and out-of-state. And again, knowing state law is going to be really helpful as to whether or not uh, they are able to uh, mail it to you out of their state or into the state, depending on where you're located. Modern guns, this is where it's a little bit harder uh, to do. And I would just, again, state law being important. And if you ever have a question, you should uh, feel free to contact your uh, ATF agent as well. Um, as the Federal Firearms Act itself and your state law. One thing uh, is that the method of shipment is often quite easy um, in considering it. Uh, for antique guns, you can use a lot of common carriers like FedEx or UPS. Uh, the United States Postal Service will ship firearms. There are some hoops to jump through, though, to make sure that uh, these things can happen safely. Um, and my suggestion is if you are the person shipping, um, to make sure that you know the carrier's regulations better than the person at the counter that you're going to meet, because um, it's likely that they won't be doing this very often. And so you'll want to make sure that uh, you go with a printout or with some information about what FedEx's regulations are or the Postal Service regulations are, so that you can be informed and give them good information about what you're doing as well. I would also recommend that you do fully disclose. I have had instances where people have thought it too difficult and decided not to disclose what was in the package. And that is a bad path to go down, because if something were to happen, um, you certainly wouldn't be eligible for an insurance uh, on the shipment. But then you've also um, created a bigger problem with now there is sort of a lost firearm out there circulating around as well. And like with a lot of other packages or a lot of artifacts that we're shipping, um, those of us in collections care will know that there are certain things that we know that we do. We want to make sure that our, our packages are insured to the full insurance value of the firearms. We want to make sure that you declare the contents. Um, requiring signatures is also very important. And then trying to ensure that they are packed like you would any other artifact. When this is incoming, this is a little bit harder to do, but you can always give um, suggestions for how a, a, a particular firearm could be packed uh, so that people have an understanding of what some of the issues might be, especially if it's heavy, um, bubble wrap, and packing peanuts, and all that kind of stuff that we're very familiar with. You want to give some guidance to those donors who are sending you items. Another precaution that some institutions take, including mine, is to ask people to actually separate parts of the gun and ship them in separate packages. So often for firearms, we talk about the receiver on modern guns and um, uh, probably stuff made in the last, certainly machine guns and stuff made in the last 100 years or so, uh, to separate the receiver uh, from the rest of the firearm itself and to ship them in two separate packages with copies of the CNR in both boxes. And if something were to happen, this does give a little bit of insurance that um, you, if something were to get lost, no one is getting a whole or complete gun. Um, there's also the risk that, again, you've lost part of a gun and not the other. But when it comes to firearms, uh, our methodology is that we do like those to usually come to us in two packages, unless for some reason, based on the type of gun that it is, that it's not possible to take it apart in that way. I've included some links here that are helpful that you can send to donors or that you can use for yourself when you're thinking about shipping our, uh, firearms to and from. Um, they are also in the handout that's downloadable on that bottom left-hand side of your screen as well. Another thing that we often think quite a bit about is that once the firearm is in our possession, how do we take care of it from there? 
So storage being the first place that most of our firearms go. Um, there are specialized storage cabinets out there for long arms, as well as for pistols and other heavier machine guns. Uh, interestingly enough, a lot of firearms, uh, like agencies like the ATF or the police departments, use similar type cabinets. Um, they're often the same sort of powder-coated steel cabinets that we use, that museums use in, uh, in storage spaces as well. So you could, depending on the size of your collection of firearms, uh, have specialized storage cabinets installed. The other thing is if they are within a, uh, in a controlled space within your storage area, uh, for those people who have lots and lots of firearms in their collections, you may very well end up with um, thousands of weapons. I've been to um, arsenals where they do have literally thousands of weapons, and they have entire rooms um, that are controlled uh, with, uh, for access as far as uh, firearm storage goes. And then finally, access. I'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, too, but you do need to think about who has access to the space. Um, who has access to the cabinet and that kind of thing when you're thinking about where to store your weapon. When firearms are on display, um, I did include a, a large weapons case that's uh, in our Roads Tokyo exhibition here on this slide. And you can see that we use some pretty standard mounting techniques. Um, one of the things that we try to do is to ensure that um, these cabinets have an extra layer of security. We work with our mount makers and our uh, case fabricators to make sure that um, these cases would be essentially much harder to break into uh, in, uh, in some instances so that you don't necessarily see where the seams or the, where the locks are and that kind of thing as well. We also try very hard to make any firearm that's on display inoperable in some way. And most commonly, that means that we remove the firing pin. Some firearms, depending on how they're made, removing the firing pin makes it so that the assembly, the bolt assembly, won't stay together. And so we will plug barrels or use other methodologies to ensure that no weapon on display is fireable. That is one of the things that we think of as a safety precaution, since this is the stuff that people will see and will know that we have if somebody were interested in stealing a gun or doing something nefarious they would not be um, able to get a functional weapon. Handling um, also is, I think, very much like uh, any other artifact. But with firearms, I, we recommend that you always treat them as loaded. Uh, we will be sure in, some instances, in most instances that they are not, because we've checked them before they entered our collection but I think as a general rule, you should always treat firearms as if they are loaded, um, point them away from you, point them away from people, and when moving them, be very conscientious uh, and conscious of your surroundings so that you're not inadvertently pointing it at someone as well. Certainly wear gloves. Uh, the finishes on many uh, of the steel elements of firearms is just as sensitive as any you know fancy silver tray that we might have in our collections as well, and so we want to make sure um, that you're wearing gloves, especially with some of the heavier guns, the one, the, uh, the grippy gloves are great. A lot of us, I like to wear just the purple nitrile gloves for a lot of the firearms in our collections as well. The other part of that is that since a lot of firearms um, are going to be, especially when first received, oily or dirty, some of that kind of thing, they'll help protect you as well from those elements uh, within the firearm itself. Um, and then finally, when handling, be careful about working the action. Um, there's sort of some back and forth about wear and tear on the actions uh, of firearms. And we try really hard not to work them unless absolutely necessary. There's a certain bit of um, keeping them uh, loose and, and work and functional in that sense, but so they don't lock up entirely. But we also uh, want to create as little wear and tear on them as possible. Then for security, this is something that each institution is going to have to sort of address in and of itself. Because where you are located, the way your staffing is, uh, how your firearms are stored are going to be some things that are unique to each institution. So some questions um, for your own security. Where are they stored? How are they stored? Who has access to them? And then finally, how are the movements monitored? Is it more secure or 
um, more heavily monitored than other items in your collection? Does it require two people if it's leaving expedition or leaving your storage area itself? Or even within storage, say from one cabinet to another, is this the kind of thing where you always want to make sure that you have two people? And depending on your staffing and on how your collection is accessed overall, you'll kind of have to sort of develop a policy to ensure that um, security is taken into account as well. So access. It's certainly important with, um, within your own staff, your collection staff, but then also uh, if you have your own security team or contracted security team, who has access and who does not have access to firearms. And then you may also want to designate times that firearms are not to be accessed. For instance, uh, if you are working on in your exhibition areas, you might decide that since that case has firearms in it, you're not going to do it until after hours. Or you may only want to do it when you have security personnel there, which might be during working hours. And again, different for each institution. And then very importantly, you should designate what happens in an emergency. I think that some of us forget, you know, we sort of lump firearms in with the rest of our collections. But they might be a part of our collection that needs a special call out to talk about what would happen in the case of an emergency if there's a fire if there's a flood, um, if you're evacuating for a hurricane, what you might do um, differently with your firearms um, so that you feel as though they are safe and the safety and security of your staff is also taken into account. Then finally, inventory is also a key part of physical control for your firearms. Um, you may be required by your state to establish a firearms register so that a dealer your the uh, local ATF agent could come at any point in time and look at your register and make sure that your firearms are where they say they are. Um, so a lot of databases, uh, depending on the database that you use, I'm going to show you a screenshot in a minute from our database, um, allows us to run reports pretty uh, any day, any time really, about where firearms are, how many in our collection, and if any of them have been moved recently. So. The other thing that we do is we have a regular inventory of firearms, 100% serial number checked firearm inventory. Uh, I would suggest this if you have a lot of firearms in your collection or even just a few, that you do conduct a regular annual um, or semi-annual inventory. I have also worked with institutions that do them quarterly, which is a lot. Um, depending on how many you have, this might be burdensome, but you should certainly try to do it annually as well. Um, do random spot checks. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is if I've placed uh, a new weapon in the collection and I'm putting it in storage, I will often spot check that shelf or that drawer to ensure that everything that's supposed to be in there is accounted for. And it's a good way um, for your regular inventory to make sure that when it comes up to that annual time, that semi-annual time, that you don't end up with a lot of issues that happened a long time ago and then nobody can remember who moved it or when or any of that kind of stuff. So I think random spot checks are excellent as well. And then I would always recommend for inventory that you have a witness. Um, for those of us who've done large inventory projects, having a second set of eyes is always very helpful. But it also means that there's some accountability along the way for uh, those of us who did the inventory that everything was on the up and up as well. And then this last screen that I'm going to show you, it's a little bit hard to see, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to give you a sense of one of the ways that we use our database is to um, show both the current location and the storage location of a particular firearm. So for us, our current location is often if it's on exhibition. So for instance, you'll see a lot of M1 Garand rifles show up in the top part of that screen, and you'll see that uh, they have both current location and storage location, or for some of them, if they've been on display for a while, they'll just have um, that current location uh, as on exhibit. So um, this is also a great tool to be able to help manage your um, inventory. Uh, this database is fairly new for my institution, so I was really excited to be able to use it to do my firearms inventory instead of fighting a Word document that someone had made a long time ago. Um, and I will now turn it over to Paul, who's going to talk to you a little bit more about uh, care for firearms now that they are in your physical control. So here you go, Paul. All right. <clears throat> Thanks, Tony. Is my uh, level okay? All right. Uh, I, okay, good. Uh, 
I'm currently the uh, sites, collections, and exhibits liaison for the Minnesota Historical Society. And uh, my current position, I deal with uh, firearms on display at uh, various sites. We have uh, two forts in our 26 site network. Um, and the bulk of our firearms collection are at, here in storage at the Minnesota History Center. <coughs> Excuse me. I did get my majority of experience with firearms years ago when I was the uh, associate conservator at uh, Texas Memorial Museum. And that's really when I <coughs> became familiar with it. I'll get into uh, how that happened in a little bit. Uh, I want to give an overview of uh, concepts uh, that relate to firearms uh, and their care, overall care and management. Um, firearms are composite objects, so I'll be talking about that. So the definition of that is uh, they're composed of both organic and inorganic materials. <clears throat> Usually in pretty close uh, proximity, uh, either in the same, same object or actually touching. So that could create uh, sometimes uh, create some condition, uh, condition problems that are unique uh, to firearms and composite objects in that you have uh, wood and metal in uh, close contact that have different, uh, different kinds of materials have different environmental requirements. Um, leather, for example, uh, leather has oils which can turn acidic over time and corrode the, the metal. And <clears throat> once you get the metal corrosion, that furthers uh, deterioration of the leather, similar uh, with wood. And then to further complicate that, uh, you can have problems from what were put on the uh, put on the objects through well-meaning preservation, uh, cleaning during use, uh, using um, degreasers or um, material uh, proprietary materials to uh, clean firearms is sometimes fairly acidic. Uh, also, oils, and I'll, I'll get to that later on as well, but uh, the whole idea of oiling uh, firearms for preservation can cause problems. Uh, some other terminology, preventative conservation, that's really what I want to talk about <coughs> today, is the more uh, modern museum standard of it's a holistic approach to where uh, we're controlling the environment, uh, controlling uh, temperature and humidity, light, uh, and pest management is also part of that. Uh, so it impacts all your collections, not just firearms, but there are certain things uh, specific to firearms as well. Um, and I, I'll get into the specifics of that uh, later on in the presentation. Restoration is what collectors, uh, antique dealers, uh, sometimes museums uh, will follow. It's really uh, returning objects to an original uh, appearance um, and form. Uh, it doesn't always respect the integrity of the object or the historic uh, integrity as well. Um, restorers can replace broken or missing components, uh, mending pieces to conceal the breaks completely. And a lot of times it may actually erase uh, damage that is historic, that, that is uh, documentation, <coughs> in other words, of the use or his and history of the object, particularly with military uh, weapons if it was damaged uh, during use or in a, in a historic battle, you definitely don't want to mend that type of break. Uh, a lot of times with historic pieces, the 
owner will have carved something into the stock, in other words, uh, their initials or something else, uh, you wouldn't want to see that as damage and fix that. Uh, conservation, again, is a, a more modern, holistic approach of um, minimal intervention, minimal treatment. Uh, it's really the goal is uh, for stabilization uh, to prevent any further damage. Uh, within conservation approach, you can use restoration uh, in a limited way of uh, replacing or fixing some parts. Um, conservators always default to the curator. So the curator, or the person who has overall responsibility for the collection, is the one who makes <clears throat> the final decision on how far to go with any type of treatment. Uh, so I always uh, defer to the curator before any kind of work is, is uh, done. They look at a treatment proposal. Uh, you do an assessment. <clears throat> I'll talk about that. Uh, a written proposal, discussion, explain what the uh, outcomes would be, and then the curator has the, the final say on that. Uh, within the conservation approach, uh, we try to adhere to principles of, well, Originally, it was formed as reversibility, uh, but over the years, through research and practice, uh, a more practical application is retreatability. So within conservation, we try to do uh, any type, any kind of intervention or material that's used in treatment that will not be completely uh, untreatable. Now, again, it, it's, it's somewhat complicated. There are some cases where you would use an epoxy, uh, <clears throat> which are filler or it, um, it, adhesives that are fairly difficult to uh, reverse. <clears throat> but it's how, how those are, are applied that would allow you to, to do some retreatability. Um, so you wouldn't want to completely seal something, uh, seal a, a firearm, a stock, uh, for example, uh, <clears throat> that would prevent you from doing anything further to it in the future. Uh, again, with, with materials that you use for cleaning, uh, for uh, limited coating, you want to make sure that those materials are compatible with the uh, object materials that aren't going to cause any further damage. So any kind of uh, waxes or other, other types of coating. Um, if you have to use a, a filler and uh, particularly mounting materials, mounting and storage uh, materials, as Tony uh, touched on, um, those need to be uh, chemically stable, uh, physically stable, not cause any any damage uh, to the object by themselves breaking down. Uh, now, a few other things uh, which she also touched on, too, is uh, working order um, you know, in, in terms of uh, managing and um, conserving firearms. Uh, working order would be where all the uh, mechanisms function properly. So uh, as we'll see, it, see in the slides further on when I get into um, 18th and 19th century, which is particularly my area of experience and what I'm really relating all this to, it, it also uh, is applicable to more modern ones. But um, I think the, be the best examples, because they're fairly simple, is to look at uh, percussion lock and flintlock <coughs> mechanisms. So with, uh, to get a piece into working order would be that uh, you know, all the screws are in place, the uh, springs are there, and um, it, it functions. Firing order is something that 
in museums and conservation, uh, you do not fire um, antique pieces. Uh, the, da the danger with that is that the metal uh, on the barrels could be stressed, and it would create um, it would change the documentation or the inf the information inherent in the object to do that. Uh, so it's not necessary to uh, conserve or restore an object to the point where it's in firing order. If you need to do a demonstration or anything like that, uh, there are replicas that are available. And that's, that's what we use at our historic sites. We never uh, allow interpreters to use any of the collections <coughs> weapons for that purpose. A uh, few more things before moving on is um, patina. Uh, versus corrosion. Now, I always refer to uh, patina or patination as a deliberate coloration of metal. Uh, you know, that goes against some curatorial definitions where uh, it's much broader, where uh, people use it to refer to uh, the surface appearance of even wood, ivory, other things that have aged over time and uh, acquired a patina or a patina of age. I use a much more uh, focus specific definition of where it's um, a deliber deliberate coloration as in sculpture uh, on a, bron a bronze sculpture where you get either a, <clears throat> a single coloration after it comes out of the foundry or um, say on a human figure, your face could be one color, the body and hair another. Uh, in firearms, generally, there's bluing uh, and browning, and there are different. There's cold processes and, and hot processes to do that. Uh, patination is a deliberate corrosion prod, uh, process that actually protects the metal from atmospheric uh, corrosion, usually caused by moisture or contact with acids. Uh, either uh, inorganic acids or body you know, from touching, handling. Uh, tarnish and corrosion would be the uh, mineral formation that can be, can actually break through a deliberate patina. Uh, and it is usually somewhat disfiguring. Uh, tarnish usually refers to a more compact oxidation layer like you get on silver. Uh, it's generally from uh, atmospheric sulfur, sulfides forming, uh, co a copper sulfide. Uh, corrosion is definition is usually uh, more uneven. And when metal corrodes, what you get is um, it builds up on the surface. And actually, you get a. Um, I think the best way to express this, as it build, as the corrosion builds up on the surface, uh, you get uh, less metal. The metal actually goes into the uh, corrosion layer. So when you clean the corrosion off, <coughs> you can get pitting. So it, you have to be very careful about that. And then I, I touched on the difference between organic and inorganic. Uh, organic would be wood, leather, anything uh, originally from a living source that contains uh, primarily carbon, and inorganic would be uh, metals in this case. Okay. Handling and assessment. So the first level of preservation, and um, I tend to use the Canadian Conservation Institute uh, scheme of the agents of deterioration. So disassociation is really their first <clears throat> main agent of deterioration uh, that can act on collections in general. So that would be preserving your uh, object information, uh, provenance, um, date, uh, anything related to when it came into the collection and its history before that. So it's essential to have everything cataloged. Um, 
and, and accessioned uh, in order to manage it properly. And really before you do any kind of uh, preservation on it, make sure that <clears throat> that is up to date and, uh, and clear. Uh, the objects themselves uh, should be labeled on, on each object. Um, generally, uh, with firearms, uh, somewhere on the stock uh, to have, uh, have a label. And um, in the uh, handouts, the tech talks, uh, the biggest uh, issue in, in part one is um, as far as updating the information on that uh, would be uh, talk about uh, using pen and ink to label. We no longer do that. We use um, uh, laser printed uh, paper labels that you can adjust the font, uh, the font size, uh, print it out, and then uh, cut out the label and use, um, generally we use a water-based acrylic um, medium as the adhesive. And you put a, a small um, spot down uh, as where you want the label, place the label on it, let that set, and then uh, put a um, clear coating over the top. Um, and then also put a uh, manila tag uh, on the piece as well, um, which allows you to handle it less when it's in storage. You can just easily access the tag. You don't have to pick up the, the object itself uh, each time you need to look at and figure out which one it is. Uh, and then the tag would stay uh, stay with the object. Once it's on exhibit, you take the tags off, save those till it goes back. And the tag can have um, location, storage location information on it, classification, uh, you put whatever information needs to be uh, associated with the object, whereas the actual object label just has the accession number. Um, and I should mention we also use the same data, uh, large database that uh, Tony mentioned. Um, and recommendations for handling, I'll just go over this again uh, in, in talking <coughs> primarily about muzzle loaders here. It's uh, relatively, relatively easy to, to check with uh, breech loaders and, and cartridge type uh, weapons muzzle loaders are a little more complicated, uh, and the uh, Tech Talk Part Two uh, has uh, detailed uh, figures and a, and an explanation of that. So it's a little hard in a webinar to to go through that uh, in a lot of detail. Um, so I'll just touch on it, but use a uh, a dowel or a gun rod that you uh, mark and then insert down uh, carefully. And then uh, check that to where it to where it um, ends to how <coughs> how far it is from the actual touch hole or the the back of the of the barrel, and compare that. And if you have more than a uh, around an inch distance, um, it's most likely you have a load in there. In that case, you want to uh, consult a gunsmith <coughs> for help with that, an experienced gunsmith. And set that aside and clearly mark it and restrict access. Uh, you don't want to try to uh, remove that yourself. Black powder can be uh, active for quite a long time. I've heard of uh, cases where Civil War uh, Artillery shells have been found underwater, and, and it turned out that the black powder, there was a, an air pocket, and the black powder was still fairly dry and could still be explosive. So uh, <clears throat> you want to have that taken care of. And any same with any antique um, artillery shells or ammunition, uh, have those disposed of either through the police department or uh, local military uh, ordnance unit. Usually, 
really helpful. Uh, that's what we did in Texas several times. The uh, <coughs> local army base would take care of those things. Um, if they could do it without exploding the historic object, that's, that's good. Sometimes they uh, can't do that. I can't disarm it or return the object to you. Uh, <clears throat> in that case, then you have to go through a deaccession process so it, it gets out of the catalog. Um, then a systematic survey uh, before you're going to do any actual interventive work. Uh, and the goal of that is to assess the overall condition of each firearm. Uh, the types of information you want to record, uh, catalog number, uh, the correct name that might take some research. Uh, you know, if you have an, an older you know, collection that came in a while back, things might be mislabeled uh, as to the, uh, the type that they are. Even the dates can be off sometimes. So you might want to do a little research on that. There's uh, some really good uh, books out there. There's one called uh, Weapon uh, by D&H Publishers. It's an excellent resource. There's also a lot, quite a bit online. Um, you know, if you know basically what you have, uh, Google that. There's um, tons, of, tons of resources, collectors, uh, websites on that that go into history and, and uh, typology and all. Uh, <clears throat> so also record any uh, serial numbers or any other markings, manufacturers. Uh, usually those are stamped in. Uh, then an exterior examination. You look uh, metal parts for corrosion, uh, uh, any kind of residues, uh, powder residue, uh, organic, anything like that. Uh, the wood parts, you look for uh, cracks. Uh, overall surface condition, uh, older uh, firearms like Kentucky, uh, Kentucky and Maryland long rifles were usually um, in an oil varnish coating. So look at the condition of that. Look for any mold. Uh, sometimes you can get that uh, near the uh, lock mortise. Uh, it's a, you know the cutout area where the lock plate is. <clears throat> and then any insect damage. Um, in some cases, you can have ter uh, termites that will get in and uh, eat out channels in the wood, leaving the, the varnish layer intact. And you don't really know um, until you look at it. Um, we'll talk about partial in, uh, disassembly. Uh, also, look at the interior of the battle, uh, barrel. Uh, for corrosion and any kind of residues, you can use a um, flash, a good flashlight for that. Uh, boroscope uh, would be helpful if you've got that. Um, also, in, in <coughs> refer back to the the tech talk to use a, um, a cleaning rod uh, with a cotton patch on it, uh, <coughs> with a patch attachment. And you can carefully insert that in, and then uh, you pull it out, see uh, how dirty it is. You know, is it bright, bright red uh, corrosion products on it? Will usually, you know, indicate that the barrel is fairly uh, involved with corrosion. Um, that's could be somewhat active <coughs> if it's a brighter red orange color. Um, and then partial uh, disassembly that. I'll get into um, with some illustrations a, a little bit later uh, that will help you um, further assess condition. And here's a uh, recommended uh, scheme uh, for ranking. And if you have a you know, relatively large collection, uh, I've always found it helpful to use numerical Rankings. Uh, it, it helps you quantify your project, uh, you know, for proposal, uh, for resources for further work, uh, to use for for grant uh, purposes. <clears throat> uh, 
and basically just organize, organize the process, uh, project. So uh, with basic condition, uh, stable, there's really little or no observed corrosion, breakage of structural problems. So that would translate it as far as a priority uh, treatment recommendation. As a low priority, probably just surface cleaning. Um, uh, rating two, uh, st stable, some previous corrosion observed, possible active. Again, it's a fairly low priority. Then uh, three, stable with active corrosion in several areas, um, usually around the uh, the breach, um, you know, where the, the firing area. <clears throat> You'll have corrosion if, if powder was left in, which could be acidic or, or they used um, a powder remover <clears throat> that generally has acid in it. And the, the wood is fair, fair to good. So that would be a medium uh, priority surface cleaning and then spot treating. Uh, and then the, the worst uh, condition number four would be unstable. Uh, we've got active corrosion, say the um, firearm was involved in a disaster uh, where it became wet or um, burned. Uh, there's uh, unstable uh, structures, broke, broken or uh, loose parts uh, that are not due to a historic, historic occurrence but neglect or uh, a disaster of some sort. So that would be the highest priority. And generally, in the large collections, over a hundred uh, to several hundred objects that I've dealt with in, in doing these surveys, um, it's usually a bell curve <coughs> where your um, majority fall into two and three categories, rank uh, ratings, two and three with uh, a few relatively few on uh, ones and fours. And uh, here's a sample condition survey worksheet and you can you know customize this uh, to however you'd like. And I, I will usually find it um, best to do this by hand. Uh, you can certainly do it on a laptop or, or a tablet. You know, when you're in the um, in the storeroom going going through the collection, and as uh, Tony mentioned, it's good to do this with two people. One person could do the observation while the other one does recording, uh, and then you've also done your witnessing and security as well, and and use this as a um, as an inventory uh, as part of that process. Uh, so. I, this includes the, the basic information, and then at the <coughs> top, it's got the summary rankings. Uh, and then I also, as a conservator, throw in estimated uh, hours, but that that could be an optional uh, thing for collections managers. That's more <coughs> for conservators' use. Um, and then I've broken out the various uh, general components for more particular uh, condition notes. And then at the bottom, a short, uh, a short narrative. So th this can be adapted how, you know, however you find it most useful. And then getting into some uh, examples of conditions, uh, fairly typical. Um, let's see. Get my pointer to work here. Go. So this is a um, uh, rod for a uh, loading rod for a muzzle loader uh, pistol, <clears throat> and it's got uh, typical uh, steel or uh, iron, um, fairly active corrosion here, um, where some moisture has gotten in. This is, this goes into a channel underneath the, the barrel. So it's fairly exposed, and uh, it's a, a personal object that I own. So <clears throat> sorry to say, but it wasn't stored in the best condition. So, but it, it does serve as a good example here. 
for what that type of corrosion looks like. Uh, this is an object from one of our museum collections that uh, this is the barrel that's been removed from the stock. So this is the, uh, the tang area and the breech plug. And you can see um, where some moisture has gotten in between the barrel and the uh, stock and caused some uh, surface corrosion here <coughs> on top of the, uh, the bluing. And then uh, you're showing the, the touch hole and fairly typical uh, corrosion where this is this level is where it's been in contact with the wood. So it's it's held some moisture. Again, that's a good example of what happens with a composite um, object with the uh, interactions of the different materials. Uh, and this shows some uh, barrel that's been cleaned in the past and, and the um, appearance when you, you've cleaned off corrosion maybe a little too aggressively and you've got some uh, pitting into the surface. Uh, this is a, um, a powder flask that's, that's got a uh, fairly um, uh, thin uh, surface pat uh, patination on it, uh, multicolor, um, showing some scratches here, uh, just from, from surface abrasion on the back, you know, where it's probably been in contact with a rough surface uh, or from use. And uh, the, the obverse of the front uh, is in fairly, fairly good condition. Uh, the brass uh, parts have become uh, tarnished. This is what I refer to as tarnish, where you get a darkening. And you can see it. <coughs> Excuse me. You can see it down here um, on the trigger guard as well. And there's also um, some evidence of um, corrosion from handling uh, with ungloved hands from uh, uh, hand oils and salts. Uh, fairly typical. Um, and then, again, it would be a curatorial uh, decision uh, in terms of treatment of how far you wanted to take this if you want to preserve the uh, tarn overall coloration, the aged appearance of it, you wouldn't uh, use chemical cleaners to um, to remove that or brightly polish it. In some cases, <clears throat> that may be what what's desired, but that would be up to to the curator for preventative conservation uh, preservation level. It would just be a surface uh, a light surface cleaning and possibly waxing. Uh, here you could see a little bit of green, uh, which is most likely from um, contact with the stock that may have had some oil in it. <clears throat> That's fairly typical um, copper corrosion. Uh, in this, uh, showing some partial disassembly, um, you see the interior of the stock, in this case, it's in, in really good condition. Uh, sometimes you can get corrosion products deposited in here, particularly at the back of the, of the tang, uh, which could also make this assembly a little tricky, um, whereas the, the corrosion products will stick the uh, metal to the, to the wood, so you want to be careful when removing that. Handling. Uh, with uh, long arms, you want to be aware of the uh, length of them, um, particularly if you're moving them in an upright uh, cart uh, going through doorways. I know it, it sounds like common sense, but uh, sometimes if you're in a hurry, um, <clears throat> not always aware of that. So it's like with handling any collections. Uh, know your pathway, you know, have enough people to, to help uh, and spot. Um, always use, you know, handle, uh, particularly with long arms, uh, use both hands when picking them up uh, and laying them down. <clears throat> with external 
lock weapons like flint locks and uh, percussion. Uh, when you lay them down, uh, the lock should be uh, facing up. Um, or use, you know, use blocks um, uh, to hold, uh, hold them upright uh, or a, a padded vise. Um, upright is for storage, long-term storage. It's best for, um, for that uh, to support them at several points. It also affords the best uh, view uh, without having to handle them. The tags are access accessible. And it's also uh, efficient in terms of space. Uh, I mentioned labeling before. Uh, handguns, uh, find that best to have in padded drawers. Um, and also to store out of the holsters and belts. Uh, and make sure that leather is out of direct contact. As, you know, as I mentioned, you get the oils from the leather that react with uh, the metal, particularly brass, uh, <coughs> and uh, create uh, or foster corrosion. Um, it's, well, in our practice, we do keep the, uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, keep the holsters with, with the handguns in storage so they don't become uh, disassociated. It's a little easier to to manage them in terms of collections management. Uh, storage conditions um, has, been, has been shown by research in the conservation field and conservation science over the last 20 years that we no longer adhere to the uh, flat line rules of uh, 70 degrees temperature, you know, 50 degrees humidity that uh, most museum objects, you know, even uh, firearms, will have become accommodated to more seasonal fluctuations. Uh, you know, uh, and annual uh, changes, uh, but you want to avoid extremes of uh, temperature or extremes of least uh, relative humidity on both the high and the old, uh, low end. Um, metals do better in lower relative humidity, 30% uh, or so. However, that's not good for wood. So with a composite object, you want to accommodate the most sensitive. So generally 30, 35% in the winter uh, to 50, 55% <coughs> in the summer. Uh, when you approach uh, 63, 65 percent relative humidity, uh, that's when mold, mold can grow or start to germinate. Um, you generally want to avoid uh, collection storage in a basement if all possible. If not, then dehumidifiers can be installed. And I uh, definitely recommend uh, monitoring uh, with uh, electronic monitors. There are some very affordable ones now um, in the archival catalogs. Also in the um, resources, I have uh, information on the Image Permanence Institute uh, <coughs> for the preservation uh, environment monitors, uh, PEM2s, which is what we use. Uh, there's also some now in uh, uh, university products that uh, Actually, it's a, a flash drive monitor, a USB, uh, that monitors and records temperature and humidity. And it's very affordable. So there's a lot of different options for uh, monitoring. And that, that helps you um, communicate the needs of the collections uh, to uh, modify uh, the conditions if needed with your plant manager, if you have one in, in your institution. Also to tell you if you if you need a um, a dehumidifier uh, with light that's more of an issue uh, for display and um, <clears throat> generally it's uh, 150 uh, lux and and uh, we also go with the the total exposure which is in lux hours 
so that would be your total time for a year. So generally, again, it's calibrated for the wood, um, so you don't get fading. Um, try to eliminate UV, but uh, the lux hours are for visible light exposure. Um, <clears throat> and it's also a good thing, if you can do it, to rotate your collections uh, so nothing is on, on display longer than a few years. Um, there's also now uh, technology where you can have visitor-activated <coughs> visitor lights and, of course, you know, eliminate direct sunlight if at all possible. Um, again, uh, mounts. Um, I see there are some questions about that. I recommend not having any kind of uh, display mounts that extend into the barrel or uh, around trigger guards. I've, I've had to deal with that when do, doing surveys to get access to objects. And uh, even if you take out the, the screws of the mounts, you know, get it off the wall, sometimes it could be uh, damaging to, to pull something that's extended into a barrel out of it, you get scratches on the, both the interior and exterior of the barrels. And there are some commercial mounts that uh, people have used. I won't mention the manufacturer, but I would definitely avoid those if you can at all do it. Um, go with custom, custom-made plexi or uh, wire padded wire mounts uh, where you use brass, brass or steel rod. <clears throat> that could be custom bent um, to for, uh, form hooks or, or fingers that support the firearm at several uh, or even edged weapon at several places. And then you could pad that with um, ar archival uh, shrink tubing. And uh, there are a few uh, archival suppliers that, that have that, such as Benchmark. Um, but ease, uh, security and ease of removability would be the main principles. And I just wanted to go over um, some sort of storage examples. And, and Tony mentioned the powder-coated uh, cabinets. And, and that's what we use here at MNHS. And these are uh, Delta design cabinets that we have in our uh, storage area. And this is customized one that holds both uh, long, uh, long arms and pistols. <clears throat> so they're, they're held in um, hinged uh, doors, so you can get several, several layers. Uh, so it's very space efficient. And they are, they are held at uh, several points and then padded here at the bottom. And here are the, the labels. <clears throat> So we don't have to pick them up to find out the accessions, accession numbers. And just uh, some close-ups here. And here it shows the um, pistols stored with the, with the holsters as well. <clears throat> and then we use uh, ethafoam uh, padding in the drawers. And just a <coughs> detail of the uh, stocks held to the um, to the doors with uh, uh, cotton tape. And some of the larger uh, weapon machine gun uh, that we have in our another storage area on open shelving, uh, which is the only way to store this type of thing. We do, ha we do have some machine guns in larger uh, Delta cabinets uh, <laughs> that are modified uh, to hold something of that size. This one is rather large and heavy. Uh, so we've got it on a bottom shelf in another storage area and then um, empty uh, artillery shells. Uh, let me see that. Uh, somebody was interested in edge weapons, so luckily I uh, put these in. This was uh, 
after I did a, a major uh, rehousing project with um, with our collections main collections manager with our edged weapons uh, collection here we modified um, <coughs> our shelving uh, or drawer units uh, to accommod accommodate both the swords and the scabbards and uh, it's fairly you know, it looks pretty complex but it was a fairly easy project to uh, to do and I had the help of a uh, in turn, uh, and it also allowed us to do inventory at the same time and, and uh, update the catalog descriptions for some of these uh, pieces. And uh, you can see some of the um, leather scabbards are in fairly rough shape, so this type of storage allows much better support, uh, much less handling, and they don't rattle around in the drawers. Um, now, uh, I'll speed it up a little bit. Uh, you can refer to the, the tech talks for more detail, but just to hit some of the high points here. Um, cleaning uh, without disassembly, uh, just use wipe, uh, wipe with a dry lint-free cloth. I, I don't recommend any metal polishes or cleaners. Uh, or wood polishes. Wood uh, doesn't need to be fed, uh, as a lot of the manufacturers will convince people. Uh, wood polishes are really just mineral oil with some scent in it. Uh, best uh, modifying or moderating the uh, temperature and humidity uh, to keep the wood in good condition. Uh, gun cleaners, proprietary gun cleaners should be avoided. Uh, oils, and this is a big one because um, a lot of um, gun collectors, uh, and antique dealers, and, and uh, antique gunsmiths will recommend uh, oiling, and and usually the the oil goes over both the wood and the and the metal uh, as a preservative that can give you a, fall, a false sense of stabilization and that uh, oils can break down. Uh, you could be trapping moisture. And it also makes handling difficult. And it can uh, get onto your uh, storage furniture and also damage other objects. So I don't think that that's a good practice and should be discontinued. Also, uh, varnishes. Uh, I've worked on had to uh, conserve pieces that had been uh, these fire uh, pistol set, including the accessories, <coughs> had been coated with a cellulose nitrate, which turned everything uh, a dark yellow amber color, and it obscured uh, very intricate uh, metal designs, uh, Damascus patterns, and uh, uh, very delicate patinas, and once that coating was taken off, both the, the metal and the wood, the, the firearms looked completely different, and they looked as they had been intended by the manufacturer as a presentation piece. Um, so avoid either spraying or brushing <coughs> varnish as a preservative. Disassembly. Uh, I think the most valuable thing uh, is to, and it's also a good volunteer uh, opportunity, um, and and uh, <clears throat> if you go to you know watch the upcoming webinar on on recruiting volunteers, I think if you have a firearms collection, uh, it's really good to use avid firearms collectors. Who make it very clear that. Uh, it's a it's a trade that they'll learn the museum and and the conservation uh, mindset and teach you how to uh, deal with and uh, work with firearms. That's how I really got my experience with it. I work with a a great uh, volunteer in at, uh, in Texas, and he learned the the museum end of it and really appreciated that. Um, 
and uh, he taught me the connoisseurship and uh, history of firearms and <clears throat> and how to uh, assemble and disassemble them. Uh, if you're going to uh, do any uh, cleaning, you know, uh, using some solvents, uh, you want to have proper ventilation. Um, also, uh, exploded uh, gun diagrams, and I give a uh, resource for that uh, online, uh, free download. And then uh, having basic tools, and again, uh, Tech Talk 2 really goes into that. So I don't want to spend too much time. Uh, just gives you an example of the types of things you need and to what you're getting into. As far as basic treatments, uh, you want to think about uh, spot corrosion reduction, any kind of uh, degreasing, uh, basic cleaning of metal and wood components, uh, interior barrel stabilization, and uh, then some coating and waxing. And the doc, uh, disassembly also helps you document the interior parts and conditions for further intervention. An example of a uh, muzzle loader that's been taken apart. And you can see uh, I just did the, the major pieces here that are held with screws. <coughs> it's a little more involved to take out a trigger assembly. You need uh, some punches, so that's probably left for full treatment. Um, same thing with the lock here. The mainspring is uh, still left, and all the, the sears and, and uh, tumblers are left in place. Uh, this is a to show an example of uh, a little more involved tool. That's a uh, mainspring vise for pulling this out. And just a close-up of a lock mechanism to show you what's involved there. And here's some resources uh, you can look at. This uh, Canadian Conservation Institute bulletin uh, is all, uh, very helpful. Goes in a little more detail than the Tech Talks. Um, uh, current catalog, uh, it's a good resource for particularly black powder, uh, supplies, parts, and books. And then the Image Permanence Institute uh, website that I mentioned uh, that goes into really good detail um, and also has um, uh, videos uh, talking about uh, storage uh, environments and uh, monitoring. OK. Now can you hear me? Susan, yes, I can hear you now. OK. Um, all right. So we only have a few minutes left. So I'm going to ask Tony and Paul if they will write out answers to your questions. And we'll make sure they all get answered. But there are a few questions that I think came up quite a bit. and. Tony's been answering some of them. So, Tony, did you see anything that you thought should be answered right away? Um, all right, can you hear me? I want to make sure, is, am I still on? Yes, you are. OK, good. Um, I think some of the ones that I have seen about are more about cleaning, which probably Paul is better um, uh, able to answer, but um, I would just suggest that you uh, do a little bit of research on finishes or proper finishes for a weapon before you dive in 
um, and use any kind of a solvent or cleaner, just like you would really with any other artifact. Um, and there are some um, courses out there uh, for this also. Oh, is there, Paul? Paul, you probably have a better answer to that for the cleaning. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And again, you know, <clears throat> I still, I touched on everything and, and still went over time. So <laughs> as you can tell, it's, it's really um, involved uh, subject. But in the publications, I give some examples of what to use. And all, and and uh, you know, feel free to contact me uh, anytime, and I'll you know by email, and I'll certainly address individual um, situations. Okay, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. Please fill out the evaluation, and we'll see you next month um, for the crowdsourcing webinar. So thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. And yes, thank you. We will be here next month. So bye bye.